Welcome to another Light Blade Learning Man. I've got the sun shining on my face through my workshop window. Um, it might make me look like a film star. Yeah, I'm a bit delusionary, I have to admit. Um, anyway, today we're going to carry on with something we started off last time, which is dots. Now today we're not going to really be talking too much about the dots themselves. We did an in-depth analysis of how dots can be formed, why they should be formed, you know, exactly all the things we're going to be looking for in this session. We had to do the preparatory work because there was a lot to get through. Now, this might look like white wine. Trust me, it's not. Um, it's just lime cordial. It's been a very hot day and I'm looking forward to the cool of the evening and settling down to showing you guys something interesting today. We're going to get into pictures and photographs and all our hard work from the last time is going to hopefully show some good results. Now there may be some surprising results but I hope they're going to be interesting for you. Now before we start we've got a couple of very important housekeeping tasks that you really must perform at some stage before you start using this machine for producing photographs or even for logos. So we need to quickly to just to jump into RD Works and I'll show you a little test program that you should design for yourself and you can use on this machine. Right, we're going to select a square, we're going to hold down the control key and we're going to just draw a square. It doesn't matter what at the moment. We're then going to put a handle around it and we're going to come up here to the dimensions and we'll close the padlock and we'll set one of these dimensions at the top here and there we go, we've drawn a 10 millimeter square and that's all our test program is going to be. We're now going to come across to the parameters and we're going to turn this into a scan program. And we're going to scan it at various speeds. So we'll just set this to 400 millimeters a second, which is one of the fastest speeds that we like to be using on our test. Power, we'll leave it at 13% at the moment. No ticks. X swing, which is important. The interval at the moment, I'm going to make it half a millimeter, 0.5. Now that's a huge interval, but you'll see why in a minute. Okay, now I've got a small piece of acrylic in there at the moment. I always like to use acrylic for test purposes. And what I'm going to do is to just set the focus up to the correct focus for this particular lens. It's seven and a half millimeters. Before I touch anything in the program, we're going to just run a test. <laughs> The first line at the bottom there was done moving from left to right and that is quite important to remember that. If you remember these strange pictures that I showed you before, the actual beam itself carries on dying way way much longer than the laser beam switching off. Now that's important to note when we look at this pattern here because this pattern starts off here and it runs to this side here and you can see there is the end of the line where it turns off hangs over the beginning of the next line so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to put in what they call an offset correction and RD Works allows us to do that and let me show you where it happened now we need to come up here to config and in config we've got system setting and if we drag up system setting just here we need a tick beside this scanning reverse interval and now we can come into this list here and I have not got anything set up for 400 millimeters a second which is the speed we're running at and it is important that you always set up one of these parameters for the speed that you're going to run at now in this particular instance we're going to run at 400 millimeters a second. Now there's something here called reverse interval which is an offset that we can apply. At the moment we didn't have anything set up so the machine is doing its own thing. 
What I'm going to do is now that I've set 400 millimeters a second up, I'm going to leave it at zero and do another test and see what result we get. The other thing that's underneath here is called offset repay. Now, you don't need to touch that at all. If you play with that, all it will do is move the position of this square pattern around. So we don't want that to happen, so we leave it alone. And there we are, we can immediately see the difference. I've now set the offset to zero, and the machine knows now that there's an offset of zero. I've put a 0.03 shift in there, which is one thousandths of an inch. Uh, I don't think it's made any difference. It's not made it better and it's not really made it worse. If we use X unilateral, it will take twice as long, but we'll only get scan lines going in one direction, so we won't experience this problem. Now bear in mind we're looking for the perfect dots. To get the perfect dots we must have the focus set onto the surface as perfectly as possible. What we're going to do is we're going to check the focus. I think the focus on here should be about seven and a half. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set it to eight and a half. And then I'll set it to seven and a half. And then I'll run down at six and a half. Now I think if you study those lines carefully, you can clearly see that the one in the middle is the thinnest line, which looks as though it's probably pretty close to the theoretical point one because the gap between those lines, the pitch between those lines, is 0.5. So just a quick estimate visually says, yeah, we're doing pretty damn good. The problem is, we're not going to get dots that size. We're going to get sausages that width. And that's going to be a bit of a problem when we run at 400 millimeters a second. But that's all going to come later when we start doing some, some actual photographs and some dots. Now I've got to go and set some scan offsets for various other speeds. You know how to do it now, you don't need to see me doing it. Now what I've got here is a piece of card which is one millimeter thick. And if we look at it, you'll find that it's not entirely flat. It's got a little bit of a bow in the middle. All I need is a couple of small neodymium magnets in the middle here and that will hold that sheet completely flat because we changed the thickness of the material set this back up to seven and a half millimeters which is the ideal focus that we're after so I've got the air assist turned off in the program because otherwise any fumes that come up will get blown down and it will paint the whole thing a brownie hue okay now despite the fact that I normally use Photoshop I'm going to be using RD works in its entirety. Some of the tools are very clunky in here but I think it will be better if people don't have to use Photoshop. I've got a 300 ppi picture here. I'm going to use the bitmap handle. You can see up here it says 300 pixels per inch. Well one of the things that I can do is I can change the resolution of the output here. So we will change that to 150 and we'll let RD Works do the change for us. So I can apply that to the view. It doesn't look as though it's changed much. Now dithering is the thing that will turn it into black and white dots. So we're going to be using dot graphic and we'll now apply that to view. Now it makes a big difference. And that's what we need to start with. Apply to source and OK. And now we shall find that we've got, when we click on there, our dotty graphics. We now go and set the parameters. That green is just a border, an A4 border, which is not going to print. It's just so that I can locate in the bottom corner Let's just show you. I've got my zero set down in this bottom corner here. That's where we're going to start. And we're going to start across the bottom of the picture because I want the scanning to move up the picture so that any fumes get drawn across the paper and any picture that's produced 
remains a nice clean smoke free picture behind it. We're going to set the speed to 50 and we're going to set the power down at 11 which is about the absolute lowest that this machine will run at. We're going to take all the ticks away from here and we're going to set the resolution to 150.1693. Make the line interval match the pixels. Okay, let's see what we get. Now, bear in mind that that's a dotty picture at 150 pixels per inch. I have to say that's come out substantially better than I expected. Um, that's almost newspaper quality. Yeah, we can see lots of dots in there, but what we really ought to do now is go and have a look at this under the microscope to see just what sort of quality we've got on these dots. I mean I can see all sorts of little details in here despite the fact that they're dotty. I can see thin hairs. Uh, quite remarkable actually. Well, we start off by looking at that streak of hair that runs across her forehead and well I think generally when we look at this picture all we can see are fairly even brown dots which is actually very good news because we haven't got gradations of brown. They're more or less all the same colour. There are some black ones which are obviously where some of the pixels have been doubled up. Um, but uh, in general the single dots are all about the same colour. Now they're slightly sausage shaped but not terribly so. Maybe one and a half or two to one ratio we've got just a little bit of gap between those lines which I suppose is good in a way because it does mean to say that well we, we put the pitch at 0.169 and I suppose the lines the burns are about 0.1 just over 0.1 maybe so it does make sense that we're going to get one or two gaps between those lines well doubling the resolution has done absolutely nothing for us at all except take all the colour out of the dots as you can see. Right, This is 50 millimetres a second so we have still got dots but the dots have lost all their colour and that's because we have basically doubled the resolution. Doubling the resolution from 150 to 300 has basically halved the amount of burn time for each dot I know it's a rather strange description, but it looks as though we're almost getting grayscale dots. Now, these are our first two pictures. Uh, <clears throat> we've sat them side by side so that you can compare them closely. Now, there's always a temptation when you're doing this sort of work to rush off and say, ah, yeah, but we've got this. We can, we can, we can make that picture a lot better by increasing the resolution. We can go faster. We can get it done quicker. You know, there are so many things that you could play with, so many factors. But what I want to do is just stop you in your tracks for a minute and say, look, let's have a think about this. Don't rush into it. We know a lot of information now. Let's put that information together and see if we can start sorting out how we can get better or not pictures. This picture here was done at 150 dpi in both X and why? Although the picture is 150 dpi in both directions, it doesn't mean to say that you have to do it 150 dpi in both directions. We can't change the number of pixels in this direction, and we can't change the number of pixels in that direction. But we can, in this direction, if we want to, change the interval, and we could effectively miss out every other pixel line. So we've only got half the information. While I was doing this, I imagined possibly that I could get better results by increasing the resolution from 150 pixels per inch and to, to 300 pixels per inch. So in other words, if I increased the resolution of the picture, I'd better get a better quality picture. Well, I think you can see for yourself that isn't the case, but why not? Because we've kept the speed the same, 50 millimeters a second. The only difference is we have in fact changed the Y pixels per inch. So we've, we've scanned half the information. So let's just stop for a second and have a quick think about what we've done. 
Right, well, we know that 150 pixels per inch, which is what this was done at, is likely to look like this, because at 50 millimeters a second, we're likely to get a dot which is around about 0.1 and slightly sausage shaped. Now the ideal dot would be 0.1, but at 150 pixels per inch, each pixel is 0.169. And our dots are only likely to be 0.1 wide. Therefore, we're going to get some white, extra white between the dots. So in this picture, as we saw, we, had, we did have a small amount of separation between the lines because we've looked at this piece here across, this piece of hair across here, and we did see that we got a small amount of white between the pixels. It probably wasn't as much as I've shown here, but this is the principle that we're basically operating on when we're working with this picture. Now when I decided to do this picture at 300 pixels per inch, but I made a silly decision to only go down in Y at 150 pixels per inch, let's analyze what I've done. So in this particular case, we've got a pixel size of 0.0847, which is nearly 0.1, which is approximately the size that we thought our dots were going to be. So if we look at how they sit in this grid, they sit in there, we've got the ability at 50 millimeters a second to burn probably every single dot. Maybe not fully black because we've got half the amount of time, remember. And half the amount of time means we're less likely to burn the whole strength of the dot. So that may well be black and that, will may, that may well be only half black, a gray or in this particular instance, a half brown. And so consequently, even though we're running at the same speed, because we've got half the amount of time for each one of these pixels, we're going to automatically get a lighter picture. So there's a good logical reason why this picture is much, much lighter than that one, even though technically it's at a finer resolution. Although I've drawn these as dots, as I've demonstrated on here, they could be single dots with a space between them, or they could be joined up dots. Uh, I'll just leave that to your imagination. Now, I know they're not the same size, but that's because I've drawn the same number of pixels. This is a 10 by 10 pixel block. This is a 10 by 10 pixel block. And this is a 10 by 10 pixel block, but it's at different resolutions. And you can automatically see how the size has changed quite dramatically. But of course, the one thing that doesn't change dramatically is this thing here. The dot size is influenced by the power, but we're keeping the power very low at the moment. So I'm keeping the dot sizes all the same so that you can see this massive comparison as you supposedly think you're going to get a picture, a better picture by increasing the resolution. Now, all you're going to do is put the same dot, if you choose, you could in this particular instance, look, you could at 300 pixels per inch, as we tried to, you could just use half as many pixels. Or if you go to 600 pixels per inch and try and do every single line, you're gonna get dots sitting on top of dots, sitting on top of dots, sitting on top of dots, and you're gonna get a very dark burn. Now, I know this is a fact because I have actually experimented with them. But what I'm saying is you don't need to experiment with them if you just stop and think about it. Look, we're going to compare these two pictures now. This is 150 pixels per inch, and this is 150 dots per inch. This one is 150 pixels per inch with 150 dots per inch in both X and Y. Now this picture doesn't look anything like that picture why not? Well, two reasons why not. First of all, I've increased the power from 11% up to 15%. So in terms of power, this 11% is probably something like about 3 watts. And this 15% has jumped all the way up to probably something like about 14 watts. 
So there's a huge difference in the power for a very small percentage gain. You need good control of low power. You do not get good control of low power if you've got an 80 or 100 or 150 watt tube in. Your best choice for engraving is going to be somewhere in the region of a 40 or 50 watt tube. It's not your best choice for cutting, but it is your best choice for engraving. Now I've got a 60 watt tube in this machine and I can just about get good results, but I have to be very careful at the bottom end here. Just pushing the power up from 3 watts to 14 watts has caused this pretty gross overburning. But in addition to that, to try and compensate for the overburning, look what I've done. I've increased the speed to 150 millimeters a second from 50 millimeters a second. So there's two or three variable changes and it makes a gross difference in the quality of the picture that you get. Just to sort of reinforce this situation that I'm talking about here at 600 dots per inch, here is a 600 dots per inch image. And to try and stop it over burning, which as you can see, it's got lots of gingeriness and burning and smoke stuff and I can, I can feel her eyes are very nearly burnt out. When I touch her hair, it's got a 3D feel to it because of the way in which it burnt into the picture here. And in fact, let me just stop a second. Yeah, that's exactly as I remember. To try and compensate for the uh, extra power that I put into it, because at 600 dots per inch, I thought, well, I need to go a little bit more powerful. I also went very, very fast at 400 millimeters a second. Yeah, it still works, but the problem is when we start looking at the dots in here, and we will go back and have a look at some of the dots in these, in these images, you will see that we do not have dots. They've disappeared. What we've got are these, what I call grayscale splurges, different levels of color caused by the fact that we have got insufficient time at 400 millimeters a second and insufficient space because we've got 600 pixels per inch. Those two factors are working together to make the time scale infinitesimally small for any single pixel. So to try and get the pixels to burn, you put more power in. But that means that when you do get blocks of pixels that are joined together, this power takes over and you get terrible burning. So trying to find a compromise, you say, right, okay, 600 pixels per inch. Um, we run 600 pixels per inch resolution down the page as well, and we'll run slower to try and get a bit more color into it, but we'll put less power into it at 12%. It still doesn't work. At the end of the day, the most balanced picture that we can come up with is one made up of dots. These are not dots as you will see when we look at them under the microscope. The crispest picture is that which is done slowest, 50 millimeters a second and a very coarse resolution. But the point that I'm trying to make here is with photographs, running fast, running powerful and running with high resolutions is not gonna get you a good quality picture you're gonna get your best results probably down at low resolutions and low speeds. It's probably better to experiment with maybe 60 or 70 millimeters a second, trying to keep the dot as round as possible, but increase the resolution maybe a little bit up to 200. Now, the one thing that you must not forget is that your lens has got a theoretical spot size. Let's just look at the best spot size that we can think of, which is a one and a half inch lens with a spot size of 0 0.075 millimeters. Or put it another way, 0 0.003 inches. Now that means that basically the best that we're gonna get if we put these dots together like this is 333 pixels per inch. 
anything above 300 pixels per inch resolution picture and really I think you're wasting your time. Now do not lose sight of this fact because this is fundamental and the other thing that you must remember is this is a theoretical spot size and when you come to put it on your material whatever that material is if you do a test burn you may well find that your spot size is not as you think that size but it's actually that size and you could be down quite easily at 150 ppi for your picture. Putting more than 150 ppi into the picture it's not going to get you anywhere. Now if you're after an art poster this one looks quite a nice soft dreamy effect, hazy, soft focus. But if you want a good creation then you're looking at something like this where the dots are actually crisp and clear and it's your eye that gets fooled. This is that curl across her forehead that I look at as a reference every time and we can see clearly uh, some lovely brown lines that run across there and we've got separation between the lines so that means we've got our scan lines which are actually quite well defined but the gaps between them are because this is only done at 150 dots per inch in the y direction and so these are exactly the same line separations that we saw in our very first crisp clean dot image. The difference is that this is not a clean crisp dot image this is a pseudo grayscale as I keep calling it because look we've got all these shades of brown in the background where different amounts of time different amounts of power are causing different colored dots so yeah this is not a grayscale picture because we are using the same power max and min and grayscale pictures come from using different power max and min so this has been created by a completely different mechanism but even though it's not part of this session I have a little bit of curiosity that needs to be satisfied so I've imported this 600 ppi picture again and we will just set up a different set of parameters speed same as it was before 400 millimeters a second power well this time the minimum power that we ever found that we could use was 11% and the maximum power that we used was 40%. Now we need to come down to here and this time we're going to output direct. And basically what that's going to do, it's going to give us grayscale engraving. Now I'm going to set the interval exactly the same as it was for the last picture, which is 150 dots per inch in the Y direction, which is 0.1 six nine three well we can clearly see the beam is on virtually continuously and stably the whole time except when it turns off right at the end of the stroke and then back on again yeah we've only got about a 10 percent variation in power across there because in the end i had to set it to between 11 and 20 percent because otherwise i was just burning through the picture so i obviously haven't got the correct parameters here but these are parameters similar to the last picture that we created with dotting and this is really all the comparison is about. It's quite entrancing isn't it to watch that beam dancing around. <laughs> okay now the one thing I me keep meaning to say when we're looking at this picture that mauve is not the laser beam. That mauve is just ionized nitrogen. It's the powerhouse that drives the carbon dioxide to go into lacing mode. So just because you see that beam there does not mean to say you're necessarily going to get power out of your laser because if there's no carbon dioxide left in your tube you'll get no power out but you will be able to see that lovely mauve beam. In fact that beam might go slightly paler and whiter as it gets towards the end of its life because there's more nitrous oxide from the um, from the free oxygen that's been released from the carbon dioxide when it's broken down into carbon monoxide and oxygen. So just bear that in mind. <laughs> the MOVE is a very good sign that your power supply is working 
but it's not an absolute certain sign that you're getting power out at the end of your tube. What you've just been watching is me trying to produce something called a grayscale photograph. When this picture started off life originally, it was full of colour. The first thing that RD Work did to it was remove the colour. And when the colour was removed, it left a black and white picture, which is basically a mixture of shades of grey. And that was what we have tried to simulate here with this dot picture. We've created the same sort of thing. We've fooled the eye into thinking there are shades of colour on that picture, but there are not. We've only got black dots and nothing. It's just the different densities of those dots are fooling your eye into thinking this is a photograph. Now, as we've already explained, the way in which the laser produces this picture is very simple. It takes the power parameter, 11%, and it sets it at a fixed value of 11%. The dot, every time we need a dot, the power switches on and we produce a dot, and then it switches off. Then it traverses along to the next dot, or in this instance, group of dots, and then it switches off. Dot, dot, group of dots. There is a very powerful function built into RD Works. It has the ability to look at a grayscale picture and sort out every single pixel into a gray value. Now the value of gray runs from white at 255 down to black at zero. Every one of those shades of gray is given a power value and then this is where the clever bit takes place. When you run your program the first thing that happens is the beam switches on and it stays on for the whole of your program. But every scan line that goes across looks like this. It starts off at zero and then it looks at the very first pixel and says, ah yes, that's a mid-gray, that's halfway up the scale. And so it produces a pixel value like that. And then it looks at the next pixel and says, oh that's nearly white. White is not much power at all. So we'll turn the power off. Then the next pixel is a slightly heavier shade of gray and then a lesser shade of gray. And as we go across every pixel, has a varying power. Obviously, if you start running the machine too fast, i.e. 600 pixels per inch or at very high speed, the machine is just not capable of keeping up with your requirements. Even though the requirements are there, the power supply and the laser just cannot do it. This is how we basically would attempt to produce my grayscale photograph. Now obviously I can only hope to perform something like this on a piece of organic material because with a piece of organic material I can get different shades of brown. When it comes to a non-organic material such as acrylic in this instance or glass, or stone, or slate, or granite, or something like that, then the only choice that you've got is a coloured dot of one shade or nothing. So there is no gradation that you can use with solid materials. Now, how successful were we? Well, there we are. The answer is not very. It's a horrible, fuzzy picture. Yes, it's grayscale, but no, there is no definition in it at all. So we'll be using the same resolution base picture, 600 dots per inch. We were using the same scanning rate of 150 dots per inch down the page. We were talk taking about a quarter of the information, but that isn't the reason why it's fuzzy, because when we did it using the dot method, exactly the same picture looks like this. So there is a huge difference between using dots and using grayscale. Basically grayscale is not for producing grayscale pictures. It's another completely different function that you can use grayscale for. It's for 3D carving. And we will get onto that subject, which is a fascinating subject, in a future session. The only way that you're going to get a picture of any sort onto a material is with the dot process. Now you don't always see the dots. This is a smeared dot picture. It isn't a proper dot picture. This is a proper dot picture 
and you can see that there's an element of crispness about this that there is not there. As soon as you start running at different speeds and different, um, different resolutions, you can smear the dots, overlap the dots, overlap the powers, and you get all sorts of interesting pictures. Some of them very soft focus, something like this, no dithering at all. All it is is basically a black and white picture. Now here we have a completely different material. This is anodized aluminium. And you see that we've managed to get a photograph down onto the surface. It's only again a binary surface, white and the background color. In this instance, we've got a silver background. So you would expect that probably a silver background wouldn't show through at all. But as you can see, we get a sufficiently good contrast to see quite a reasonable photograph. I will point out to you two things. First of all, 80 millimeters a second, very slow speed, and 11% power, very low power. Now look what happens when I change to just 10%. Look at the quality difference in the, in the image. Again, I'm reinforcing that control of low power is an essential thing when you come to engraving. Well, we've banged on enough about dots and photographs and I think you've now got enough information in your toolbox to go away and play for yourself. So for the final part of this session, what I'm going to do is show you a real project that I had to carry out for a friend of mine. So it involves Photoshop, I'm afraid, or some sort of photographic processing software, because quite often you cannot get the correct image that you're looking for down onto the medium that you want to apply it to. Now this particular project is basically going out of my comfort zone. I'm going to have to go into Photoshop, which, okay, I know my way around Photoshop, but, but I am not a graphic artist. In fact, I'm not any sort of artist except the um, up against the wall type. So you'll have to forgive me for some of the liberties that I might take. I'm an engineer, not an artist, and I make no excuses for that at all. So I hope that what we're now going to see is a practical demonstration of all the elements coming together that we've been learning about. I've got a real job to do for someone, a friend of mine, who has asked me to immortalise her dog on some coasters. As you can see, this is not exactly the best picture in the world to work with. It's not a studio quality picture. So somehow I've got to get the essential qualities of this dog's face onto a piece of wood. Now I'm not going to take you through every single step in detail but I am going to show the outline of what I'm going to do to manipulate this picture. So the first thing I've got to do is to physically crop the head fairly tightly so that I don't get too much of that bright red coat in the background. And let's bring the picture up to a decent size so we can see what we're working with. OMG is your immediate reaction. Look at the state of his tongue. Saliva, mud. So we'll choose that area there and now we'll start working away to try and put some pink. Once this goes into grayscale it will be a shade of grey. Well that's not a perfect tongue but at least it's better than it was. So we then use the clone stamp to copy the colours off of his muzzle here and try and get rid of those mud spots. We can do this with a lasso tool we can work our way round his head approximately. So now we've got another layer which is that layer there. And as you can see we've probably removed a large part of the background. We've also removed some of his tongue but this is not what I finished up with. Now the biggest problem that we've got here is if we take a look at image adjustments we can check brightness and contrast and we what we're trying to do is to bring his eye up. This eye here is not very prominent. Even when I push the contrast up which is what I shall need to do that eye is not very distinct. I'm going to capture this eye here. 
rather carefully. Edit, copy, edit, paste. And you say, well, I haven't done anything. Well, yes I have, because if I select this layer and I now use the pointer, oh look, I can pick up his eye. And I can now put that eye over there. So now I've got two fairly bright eyes to work with. The other thing that I've got to do is because I know that when these eyes are on wood they will not show up against this black dark background and so consequently what I'm going to do I'm going to choose some rather hideous colour like that and I'm going to turn him into a werewolf. Now you definitely wouldn't want to meet that dog on a, on a dark night would you? <laughs> and so you can see how I had to basically manipulate that. Oh one other thing I didn't mention which I had to do I had to take a clone stamp and I had to clone these little frilly bits of the tops of his ears here and I had to put them on the crown of his head because there was no definition between this white section here and the background. So although this hair isn't real it just gives the impression it delineates the outside of his head. So you can see if you look at that in detail it's not necessarily a very good quality picture. Okay now when we import that picture into RD Works, it looks pretty scary doesn't it? So the first thing we're going to do with that picture is make it 95 millimeters and then I'm going to create a square 100 and then we're going to put that square around the outside of the image and we'll make that into blue. So the bitmap is black and we're going to have a go at cutting that in a minute at about a hundred and I think we'll probably set the power to just a little bit over the minimum I think that 12% is pretty good blowing no we'll check the cut speed the cut speed is about five millimeters a second because this is going to be done out of a probably five millimeter um, marine ply probably 67% 67% which is about as high as my tube will go okay so now let's go back to the picture itself bitmap handle and you can see we've got a resolution here of over a thousand I think we'll set that to a 200 we'll push the boundaries of what we've just discovered and then we will do dither and we'll set it as dot graphics. We could play with the contrast and the but at the moment I think it probably looks reasonable. So we say apply to view and immediately we lose all the detail. So now we can play with these colors here contrast and brightness apply to view And there we go we can get some of the detail back here as you see now that looks like a reasonably balanced view so we can say apply to source now and then when we look at this there we go and this time you can see the smoke being pulled away nicely towards the back of the machine where it's extracted down the slots Well I've now put the cover down so that we get a good jet of air flushing across the surface there and as you can see you can probably see hardly any smoke at all. It's all being dragged backwards really really quickly. Now what 
you're seeing at the moment is a cut taking place where the air assist has actually turned on automatically on its own. Now if we take a look at the quality of that cut you can see that there is absolutely no smoke burning on there at all except the only hint of browning that we've got is at the very very start point there and the very very finish point but everywhere else is absolutely clean and the reason why we've got a lovely smoke free finish here is because the smoke is passing all the way through this job there's nothing hitting the top surface it's all going down underneath and has either been drawn away by the airflow underneath or has been condensed on this surface here as you can see leaving a horrible sticky goo behind now that's another reason why I'm using a solid steel plate because when this job is over all I'm going to do is to wipe that plate clean if I'd have been using a honeycomb table I can't clean the honeycomb table. As you can see all this muck on here, look it's all horrible brown sticky muck. That's the stuff that would have gone onto the top of your cut and onto the top of your job had you had the air assist on while you were engraving. And that's the stuff that actually paints the surface of your wood brown. You don't want it. You want to get rid of it before you blow it back down onto the job. So basically for air assist you only need it for cutting and you want to blow all your muck out of the bottom of the job but for engraving you want to let it drift up into the air and get it sucked away and not blown back onto the surface of the job. All this brown muck here? Well sometimes you can get away with something as simple and benign as white vinegar so let's give that a try. It really depends on the debris itself. Now because that's a natural wood and that's probably just a, a normal resin um, it came off fairly easily with white vinegar but here we've got some acetone now obviously it's not the sort of thing that you would let kids play with and you would normally have rubber gloves on or plastic gloves so that you don't take the, the oil out of your skin but I'm afraid at my age I've got a very tough skin I've been involved in engineering for many years. Um, for just a few seconds work, it's not a major problem. But if I was handling this stuff all day, my skin would literally dry and crack. So it's not the sort of thing you normally use without brush. Now here are our coasters. And you may possibly spot that there are two at the back that look slightly softer. They're not quite as crisp as these when you look at them with the light across them and that's because these are coasters and they are going to be subjected to spillage whether it be beer wine whiskey something is going to be spilt on these you can be assured of it if it's me well it's going to be black coffee here I've got some just natural beeswax this is called brywax. It's mainly beeswax with a sort, little bit of sort of something like white spirits in it to make it slightly soft. It's not a hard beeswax, as you can see in here. It's a sort of a, a slightly soft, uh, creamy mixture. But it is a natural material, and it sinks in to the wood. And so what I do with these, I protect the wood. When you first put it on you think, oh my goodness, what's happening here? We're going to fill in all the engraving. But because it is a wax and oils, what tends to happen is, over a few minutes, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, you'll find that the, the wax actually sinks into the wood. And here we are, look. When you first do it, it looks pretty horrendous. But just be patient and all will come good in the end. Paint the edges, which seals any coloration that may be wanting to come off. It seals it in. And then we do the backs as well. Just paint it on with a brush. Don't put it on with cloth because cloth will leave lint and various other pieces of white in your engraving. Yeah, it feels so real. Now, I do hope that that last practical demonstration has brought the whole thing together. Now there was no cheating with that at all. There was no practice. I went straight in with a 
resolution. I went straight in with the speed. I went straight in with the power. And we got excellent results. And that's what I hope this session has given you. Confidence to dive straight in with a set of good, maybe not perfect, but good parameters. So, until the next time, cheerio.